This is video number five, part two, in our series about myopia. In it, we continue our exploration of treatment methods aimed at slowing progression of myopia, looking at their effectiveness and how they are used in practice around the world. In this series, we have divided myopia into five subject videos covering what is myopia, what can go wrong, eye growth and how it diverges into myopia, and treatment methods. Our exploration of the treatment of myopia is divided into two parts. In part one, after a review of myopia and emetropization, the substance of this video is the exploration of individual treatment methods, how they work, and what are their results. In part two, we continue our review of treatment methods. Results are presented in two parts. First, the result of each study is compared to its control and side-by-side -side against other study results. Second, methods are ranked on a scale of effectiveness. The big decision comes with the question of how to apply the treatment methods. This is one of several proposed algorithms. To see what is happening in practice, we show results of a worldwide survey of those who treat myopia and the methods they chose. Because atropine is the most common choice, we include a section on its potential side effects. We close this section with a perspective on why treat, using a recent study on risk versus benefit of treatment. These are the leading treatment options for myopia prevention. Some form of multifocal glasses, contact lenses, ortho-K lenses, medication, particularly atropine, and increased time outdoors in bright light. We have discussed that myopia progress can be measured in two ways, refractive change and axial length change. Most studies report both, but orthokeratology results can only be measured in axial length because the rigid lens directly modifies the cornea and thus the refraction. In addition to our tally of results, we have a 2016 meta-analysis to help us put the various methods in perspective. These authors propose a ranking of effectiveness based on reduction of myopia development relative to single vision correction. I'm going to present this here for perspective as you go through the re review of the results. Here are the ranking criteria. For refraction, a decrease of half a diopter or greater per year, Wang calls strong. One quarter to a half diopter is moderate and less than a quarter diopter as weak. There is a corresponding scale for axial length. Let's apply that to an example. The Comet study used progressive bifocal lenses, which resulted in an average decrease in myopia of 0.06 diopters per year compared to the control. On the Wong scale, the Comet study shows a weak effect, as the authors of the study confirmed, and they suggested it was not worthwhile as a treatment option. Looking at a broader view, these are the controls for each study. The average progress was just over half a diopter per year. By Wong's criteria, a strong effect would essentially neutralize the average yearly progress. Also note there is variability by geographic region. Let us go one step further. Recall the rate of increase of myopia relates to age of onset. This data comes from Guangzhou, China, one of the areas with a high rate of myopia. Doing a bit of math, we can calculate the yearly change in refraction. In this case, for myops with onset at age 8, their initial change was 0.88 diopters per year, by age 17 dropping to 0.52 diopters per year. Doing a, co a comparison across age of onset groups at age 12, all of them had more than half a diopter per year of change. 
Now we are ready to compare results across studies. We have divided this into two groups because they won't all fit on one page. Our first grouping includes the various glasses options. The second is non-glasses results, contacts, atropine, sunlight, and ortho K. Recall, we recast the result of each study in bar graphs for this comparison. The blue bar on the left of each study is its control group. At the top of each bar is the refractive reduction per year, both the absolute number and percentage. In terms of refractive change, undercorrection was not successful. Results for bifocals depended on the type, as did results with peripheral ad lenses. The results were the same when measured by axial length change per year. These are the refractive results for the non-glasses studies. Multifocal soft contact lenses results depended on the type. Atropine showed a strong effect, but remember we talked about the long-term advantage of the low-dose choice. Outdoor exposure effect was only modest. Ortho K showed a consistent effect. On the far right, the Kinoshita study is Ortho K versus Ortho K plus atropine. Axial length results are the same, except for the low concentration of atropine, which we mentioned before. From this review of selected principal studies, you get a picture that there is a range of results. Let's return to the Wang 2016 meta-analysis and look at their results. These are the abbreviations used in their figures. The presentation of results by forest plot makes a nice intuitive view. The right column shows the refraction difference per year as a result of the intervention and its statistical significance. The solid gold line is the control, the amount of refraction change with just standard glasses correction. I added the dashed line at the half diopter threshold for strong effect. Of the methods that showed a statistically significant effect, all were medications. Only atropine met the strong criteria of reduction of half a diopter per year. The other options are rarely used. The middle group of interventions showed a small but measurable effect, reducing myopia progression by, at most, a quarter diopter per year. The bottom group did worse than standard glasses. Complementary to refraction data, there is also the forest plot for axial length. Again, control is the solid line, the strong effect is the dashed line. For the statistically significant group, atropine is still leading the way. A notable addition is orthokeratology. For a final review, the authors combined refraction and axial length results in one table. It is a bit of a repeat, but we will be brief. The strong effect group are all concentrations of atropine. The red arrowheads are other medications. Perenzepine is similar to atropine, but is not widely available. Timolol showing no effect. The moderate effect group is headlined by ortho-K. Also included are the peripheral modified contact lenses and the prism bifocal. The LAM peripheral defocus glasses came after this was published. The weak effect group included bifocal glasses and outdoor time. Ineffective were standard glasses and contact lenses. Recall, these were the control groups. We now arrive at the reason for all this work, reducing incidence of myopia, which means we face the decision of who, when, and how to treat. In previous videos, we have learned about the natural history of myopia. How does that guide our treatment strategy? In 2015, the multi-center CLEAR study looked at multiple risk factors correlating with risk of developing myopia. Their conclusion was, 
the best predictor of myopia development was baseline refractive error, nearly the equivalent predictive strength of the other eight variables they studied put together. Using the course of natural history, they set treatment cut points. For example, they note that children at age six who are less than three-quarter diopter hyperopic are likely to end up as myopes, the same result as the previous Orinda study in 1999. The progression of myopia may be easier to see in this graph from Chua, using the same strategy that the best predictor of degree of myopia development is what age it starts. If you want to keep myopia from ending up over minus three diopters, one would consider treatment if onset happens before age eight. This is the same kind of natural history data from WHO in 2020. It is notable that if myopia started at age eight, the average outcome is over minus six diopters. Put another way, this is the percent chance of developing high myopia based on age of onset. We also recall the divergence into myopia began several years before crossing the myopia threshold. Another treatment strategy is based on rate of progression, as suggested in the 2016 Atom paper. Children aged 6 to 12 with myopic progression of half diopter or more per year would start on atropine 0.01% once daily for two years. At the end of the second year, their response would decide whether to continue. If response is good, less than a quarter diopter progress in year two, atropine could be stopped. If response is moderate, one quarter to three quarter diopters, then continue the drops. If response is poor, progress greater than three quarter diopters, then they are not likely to respond to the atropine and the drops could be stopped. These are examples of different criteria of when to treat decision. As always, such treatment decisions are reached jointly between the eye doctor and the family. We have seen myopia is increasing around the world, in some places more than others. We will now look at how the various treatment options are currently being used around the world. What is happening in practice? In 2020, Leshno published a survey of pediatric ophthalmologists worldwide. He asked who was treating myopia, what were the criteria to start treatment, and what treatments did they use. Of the nearly 800 surveyed, about 57% engaged in treating myopia. We start with the various reasons for initiating treatment. Results are presented by world region. These are the percent of physicians who treat any level of myopia. The green bars show percentage who treat based on age of onset. The numbers at the top are the average age for each region, which range from five to six years. The gold bars are percent who treat by amount of myopia, ranging from one and a half to three and a half diopters. In the Far East, treating at a lower level that would be consistent in trying to deal with their high level of prevalence. By far the most common reason for initiating treatment is rate of myopia progression, the orange bars. The average threshold for treatment was about one diopter per year. These are the various methods chosen for treatment. Atropine in red dominates in most of the world except Europe where optical choices are preferred. Behavioral measures include reduced near work and more time outdoors. Combinations are often employed, as shown here for North America. Remember, we talked about ortho-K plus atropine. In East Asia, however, they use slightly different combinations. As promised earlier, because atropine is such a common treatment choice, we return to answer a couple of important questions. How does it work? And what are the potential side effects? In animal studies, we saw that blocking accommodation by various methods, including atropine, 
did not affect myopia development by form deprivation. Which leads to a significant and unanswered question of how does it work. Researchers who work on this suggest atropine and other similar medications work by a different pathway. Stated briefly and in somewhat technical terms, the parasympathetic nervous system controls two-thirds of accommodation via ciliary muscle contraction and the pupil sphincter. These respond to acetylcholine via muscarinic receptors. Muscarinic receptors are also one of the candidates for controlling eyeball growth via remodeling of the sclera, though the specific mechanism has not been identified. Atropine comes into play as a blocker of muscarinic receptors. On one hand, leading to its predictable, undesirable effects on reading and near vision. On the other hand, including the desirable effect of slowed growth. The mechanism for this action remains to be determined. Since atropine is in widespread use, it is important to understand its potential side effects. Atropine causes blurred near vision and sensitivity to bright light. The process of focusing up close is called accommodation. It requires three parts, two of which are affected by atropine. One, atropine paralyzes the ciliary muscle so the lens is unable to shape shift to close focus. Two, atropine also renders the pupil unable to constrict, meaning depth of field remains expanded. Lastly, a dilated pupil means the eye is unable to defend itself against bright light, resulting in photophobia. Let's look at how these effects played out in the trials. Regarding near vision, the amount of power you have to focus up close can be measured. This is the baseline accommodation measurement for children in the ATOM study. At ages 6 to 12, the average was about 16 diopters of focusing power, enough to allow you to focus up to 2.5 inches from your eye. With the drops that block accommodation, the ability to focus up close drops precipitously in the higher concentrations, but only mildly in the lowest concentration. To put that in perspective, this is how focusing power decreases over your lifetime. A gentle way of saying, as you get older and need reading glasses. A 10-year-old has roughly 14 diopters of focusing power, which gives a lot of reserve for close focus. Unfortunately, focusing power is in a constant decline from there. Sometime around 40, focusing power drops to around 4 diopters, which is the point where most people start to need help with reading glasses. Keeping that 4 diopter number in mind, either of the two higher strengths of atropine have reduced the child's focusing power to that level. Whereas the lesser strength leaves around 11 diopters of focusing power, which is more than adequate for reading and close work. This shows the near vision measurements. Without worrying about the units, the higher numbers represent poorer vision. The point is, there is a notable reduction in near vision in the higher concentrations as opposed to a minimal reduction in the lowest concentration. That difficulty with near vision is reflected in the percent of children who requested reading glasses for close work. Well over half in both of the higher concentrations, but only 6% in the lowest concentration. The remainder had single vision distance glasses. The other vision-related side effect of atropine is pupil dilation, which affects focus and causes sensitivity to light. They measured the children's pupil size in bright light, which averaged 4.5 millimeters in diameter. On the drops, pupil size increased significantly in the higher concentrations, around 3 millimeters in both, whereas pupil size increased only about a millimeter in the lowest strength drop. To address this, the children's glasses were photochromic, meaning they darken in bright light. Other reported ocular side effects included ocular allergy and eyelid dermatitis. Those were infrequent, but more likely to happen in the higher atropine concentrations. Reports of systemic side effects are very rare. 
In summary, the ADAM studies have shown atropine lowers progression of myopia. What initially looked like an advantage of greater strength turned out to be the opposite. And the lower percentage had the least amount of side effects. If you want to read further about treatment options, there are multiple reviews in the literature. For example, there is a current major review by the European Society of Ophthalmology and the International Myopia Institute. Also from the Inter International Myopia Institute is a very recent review with many all-star authors. And here is a risk-benefit analysis from more major authors. I highlight this study because the risk versus benefit analysis gives us one useful perspective on why treat. So far we have established the risk of vision loss increases with the degree of myopia. Bullimore calculates approximately an extra year of vision impairment for each diopter increase in myopia. Here they got more specific and calculated for each additional diopter of myopia the percent of increased risk for specific eye problems. The complementary observation is that reducing myopia results in less complications. The higher the level of myopia, the greater impact of myopia reduction. Specifically, one diopter of myopia reduction can prevent between 0.74 and 1.22 years of visual impairment for myopia from minus 3 to minus 8 diopters. Thus, the authors conclude one diopter of myopia reduction is meaningful. For those who are interested, they have also calculated number needed to treat to reduce vision impairment by five years. In terms of treatment methods, we have seen that they vary in their levels of effectiveness. These authors estimate that, with current methods, a one diopter reduction in myopia would likely take five years of treatment. What are the risks of treatment? Two methods have potential significant side effects. Contact lenses introduce the risk of bacterial infection in the cornea, which can cause scarring and reduced vision. They review the literature and come up with an estimate of low risk. Atropine is low risk, as we discussed earlier. The conclusion of these authors is that the benefit of treatment in reducing vision loss outweighs the low risk of vision loss from contact lens use. Given the investment in time and effort required by these methods, it will require significant education for parents and don't overlook engagement with their myopic children. With that, we come to the end of video number five. In video two, we saw myopia is increasing around the world, in some areas reaching epidemic levels. Why care? Partly because the blurred vision needs to be addressed, but also because there can be pathologic changes that pose a risk of vision loss. In this video, we covered multiple treatment options aimed at reducing myopia development. We have reviewed the effectiveness of each method. There are other areas that have been under investigation as potential causes and or treatments of myopia that have yet to establish themselves. And we have looked at different treatment decisions and how they are applied around the world. This concludes our video on myopia treatment, the last in our series about myopia. While both the understanding and the treatment of myopia remain works in progress, myopia is an increasingly important subject in worldwide public health. In this series, we have divided myopia into five subject videos covering what is myopia, what can go wrong, eye growth and how it diverges into myopia, and treatment methods.